So digestion issues, heartburn, indigestion, gas, bloating, constipation, right? So even, you know, in medical school, I was taught that if you didn't have a bowel movement for uh, for three days, that's okay. That's normal. Well, I'm here to tell you guys that is not normal. Everyone should have one bowel movement at least every day. And we should be having sometimes up to three based on how much fiber we're eating. But digestion is a big sign. Bowels changing, stool changing. My patients know that when I talk to them, I'm always asking about their stool. What does it look like? Does it flush well? Is it sticky? Because those are clues to tell me that your digestion is working well or not well. Decreased performance. So I can't sit through a meeting. I can't seem to remember things as well. I'm not, I'm, my boss is on me because I'm not as productive, right? Or maybe athletic performance. I can't, I'm more tired now on my same five mile bike ride. I need two days to recover. These are signs along with weight gain and concentration issues and irritability and worry, right? So as we age, as we go through hormone changes, as we go through different stressors, we are going to be kind of inviting some of these symptoms to start. And what I'm asking is pay attention to them to understand that your body needs some more assistance. So one question I always ask my patients in order to find out what their personal trigger has been is when did you last feel well? And people really have to think about this because you're so used to kind of being tired or kind of being sluggish or being achy. It's really hard to remember. Oh, well, maybe it was when I remember I felt really not great after I had that trip or, you know, when I went and swam in Indonesia um, and I had, I came back and I had a GI issue. And ever since then, I've been really struggling. And so that clues me into maybe this is something parasitic. Maybe this is something in your gut that's inflaming you. Maybe this is an infection. Maybe now you have a leaky gut, food sensitivity. So it starts to um, really help us understand if an infection started it, a surgery started it, an accident started it, high periods of stress, a loss of a loss of someone, or a huge caregiving responsibility, never under mess us to, never underestimate the, the role of that stress plays in terms of caregiving, um, in terms of taking you know taking care of um, children or parents because that is a gigantic stressor for people along with the loss of whether it's a spouse or a parent or a move, like moves are one of the largest stressors, a loss of a job. Um, if you start to kind of unravel those things, it helps us figure out what it was that can maybe we start with in terms of the testing. And I'll come to the testing later. But as we go through the motions, we want to think about when did we last feel well to help us understand what we can do about it. You go to your doctor, you're not feeling great and you get a whole blood workup, everything's fine. Everything's normal. And that is because there are hundreds of markers of the immune system being angry, and we check for maybe one or two of them in our lab tests. So most of the time people come to me and they are coming to me because their traditional workup has been, you're fine, there's nothing wrong with your blood works normal. Oh, I don't feel well. I'm gaining weight. I'm sluggish. I can't think anymore. What is going on? I'm so achy. There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. So one, there are multitude of tests out there. Um, I'm in a functional medicine doc. So I do tests for microbiome. We do tests for nutrients. We do tests for hormones. We do tests for um, neurotransmitters. Lots of different things outside of the traditional blood work. So there is a huge array of testing that can be done. But quite frankly, sometimes we just never find it on a test. We just have to go with the symptoms. So what do I am? Um, some of the rationale that people have when people see me is, well, I wasn't going to come because what do I expect? I have so much going on. How am I supposed to feel? Which is how honestly how I felt when I was taking care of kids, working a full time job, learning about acupuncture, um, doing all this extra stuff, taking care of my parents. What am I supposed to feel? I'm supposed to feel tired, right? So nobody, we don't have an alternate version of us. So we want to be able to understand that when you feel like this and when you're rationalizing like this, it is something that's still out of balance. I don't have time to worry about this. I have so many things to take care of. I heard that so-and-so said I should start doing X, Y, and Z, maybe walking 10 minutes or yoga, um, but maybe I'll start next week. What am I complaining about? Because the other person I know, she's dealing with cancer. So my little ach achiness and pain should be nothing. What's my problem? Why am I worrying about this? These are all negative talks about things 
that continue people ignoring their symptoms. So I really want to stress that if you're finding yourself think like this and you're not feeling your optimal self, still pursue a workup and start with lifestyle. So before I talk about what we can do, let me just speak a little bit about how we break down. So we talked about what stress is, what what kind of stressors there are, and we talked about what inflammation is and what the immune system does. We have another area of how we break down, and that's called the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is um, really about the nervous system that is the sympathetic, which is fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. This nervous system is not volitional, which means I don't control it. It is a, it's subject to the stressors in my life and what I'm exposed to. And so it activates to keep me safe. It activates to get me out of danger. So the sympathetic goes up, for example, if I'm in the playground and I see my child fall um, from the monkey bars, then my sympathetic kick, system kicks in, it's fight or flight. My heart rate goes up, my blood pressure goes up, and an adrenal hormone called cortisol goes up, which it should. It's trying to get me to move. It's trying to get me to flood my, the, uh, my muscles with, with blood flow and get me to the point where I can help my child. So the same is true for if you're running, if your house is on fire, um, things like that, you know, things that are really threatening to our, our system. So cortisol goes up, blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up. Great. But after that, we're supposed to activate the parasympathetic system. This, these two systems can never be up at the same time. So when the sympathetic system is up, the fight or flight's up, the parasympathetic system is not. Parasympathetic system is our rest and digest. And rest and digest is what happens when we see animals in the wild, they go after their kill and their heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes up, and then they pass out. They pass out for 10, 15 minutes because they're resting and they're digesting. But we don't do that. We don't do that as, as, as humans. We keep going and we keep going with fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight. The rest and digest keeps going down. And in my practice, this is what I think about when I see people, the separation of these two areas is where all the symptoms are. And these symptoms, I can't change people's lifestyle. I can't change the fact that someone has a bad boss or someone has to take care of their children and their grandparents and their mom and dad or whatever their life is. But what we can do is we can charge their parasympathetic. We can increase their, um, what I would call charge rate. It's just like you plugging in your phone. You're charging yourself up. So the separation of these two things is less and your symptoms go down and you start to heal. We want to put our bodies more in parasympathetic system using our vagus nerve because the vagus nerve innervates the parasympathetic system. We want to use this and charge our, charge our battery all the time because that's allows, that allows our healing. Our bodies want to heal us. They want to keep us in balance. So we have to look for the signs and the symptoms and do the things that will activate that parasympathetic. What is parasympathetic? parasympathetic system is rest and digest. So we work on digestion and we work on rest. Rest is sleep, but it's not just sleep. It's also what our thoughts are doing all day long. What am I thinking about? Am I afraid? Am I worrying too much? This is all affecting my parasympathetic and my vagus nerve. So that is that separation, which we'll also talk about today. Okay. So as we kind of go through our life, and even if you lived in the Himalayas, I'm sure there's stress responses everywhere. So if you are constantly affecting your sympathetic drive, you know, I have bills to pay. I'm worried about my job. My boss is really being mean to me. I have to get my kid to soccer. I can't get this email out. Whatever it is that's affecting our sympathetic drive. And remember, these things are not crazy, toxic things that your life is actually affected by in the sense of you're threatening your life. It is inconveniences and hardships that make the quality of our life not great. But our brain and our autonomic nervous system does not know the difference. We have evolved over thousands of years and how we have evolved is that our body keeps us safe. So what were our threats before? Our threats were related to you know, famines and our threats were related to injury or bodily harm or threats from different tribes coming at us. So we react the same, regardless of if you're sitting in traffic or your house is on fire, or you're running from a tiger, that sympathetic system is still kicking in. So if you kept encouraging that sympathetic system about the worries and the fears and the 
and the things that are not going well, the cortisol goes up. And I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm not saying that this is just in your head. This is life and people have lots of stressors. Um, but you're activating that cortisol, you're activating that blood pressure and you're activating that heart rate to go up. So persistent elevations of this high cortisol which cortisol is an adrenal hormone, but it has a lot to do with glucose regulation, which is sugar. Our glucose regulation affects our insulin resistance. And insulin resistance, which is the hormone that gets the glucose into the cells, insulin resistance is a big part of different metabolic issues. So if I kept my cortisol up and I kept my glucose elevated and my insulin was dysregulated, I can turn that into things like metabolic syndrome. I can turn it into heart disease. I can turn it into risk factors for strokes and dementia and diabetes, right? So there are precursors that you don't just wake up one day and have dementia. It has been a process that has been happening over years that can actually turn into it. Again, when we ignore our symptoms, we're ignoring the potential for reversing these things. Um, heart rate goes up and stays up, it can turn into what's called tachycardia, it can turn into arrhythmia, it can turn into atrial fibrillation, um, high blood pressure that stays up as part of the sympathetic drive can also turn into something like hypertension. And when people have insulin resistance and hypertension, they're at higher risk for things like heart disease and strokes, right? So even in women for insulin resistance, we have increased risk for menstrual irregularities, polycystic ovaries, infertility issues, So what I'm trying to say is that this specific symptom of elevation can turn into, because of the immune system connection, because of the autonomic system connection, it can turn into multiple diagnoses that you see your doctors for. Um, So we want to control that persistent elevation. Cortisol also, in addition to sugar regulation, has a lot of control over the immune system. Initially, when you have cortisol elevation, you are in an anti-inflammatory state, right? So you see when women, sometimes you see people, um, their child is stuck under a car and the mom lifts the car up and you're just like, how do you do that? Well, that's a lot of adrenaline in her. And that's also cortisol that's protecting her spine and her muscles because it hurt. It would hurt a lot if she did that, if she didn't have that cortisol. So it's an anti-inflammatory initially, but if it's persistent, it turns into those dysregulations of what I talked about before, which was, difficulty uh, controlling infections, difficulty with maybe allergies and difficulty with autoimmune. And not everybody has the same breakdowns. Everybody's breakdown is very unique. The other big thing that cortisol does, it is the quarterback for all of our other hormones. So cortisol not only is our adrenals, which is does a lot for us, it manages weight, it manages um, salt and potassium balance, it manages our energy, But it also, and it is also our wake up hormone, but it also affects multiple other hormones. As a symptom complex, these differences can look like weight gain. It can look like fatigue. And some people may have heard the term adrenal fatigue, um, which is like a, which is a constant stressor that actually depletes your adrenals and your adrenals are actually working, but they are not able to handle the stress that your, that you, your body needs to handle because they're just getting depleted. So um, there's no dysfunction with the organ. It's just a kind of muckiness with the pituitary and and the the adrenals. So some people can have allergies from this, autoimmune from this, difficulty fighting infections. But one of the biggest things I see is weight gain. And why is that? Well, adrenals, also the cortisol, is the pyramid of hormones, can affect multiple other hormones. So your cortisol can affect your thyroid, which is in charge of your metabolism, and your hair, and your skin, and your and your ability to go to the bathroom every day. Um, And also, it can affect all the sex hormones, your estrogen, your progesterone, your testosterone, which are actually very anabolic, means estrogen and testosterone builds us. It makes our bones. It makes our muscles. We are built by it. It's anabolic. But when we are in the cortisol phase, where we're trying to take all our energy and just trying to stay alive, Our adrenals get all the attention from our body and the sex hormones don't really matter. It does not matter if you're running from a tiger, if you want to conceive. It does not matter if you have a libido, if you are running from a tiger, right? So your brain is trying to prioritize what is important and trying to save you. So 
keep that in mind when you think about how much stress you're under. I have a lot of people coming in for me who says, I have no libido. I can't, you know, I can't build muscle mass. And part of their problem is not necessarily just they're in perimenopause or menopause. They're stressed out. And when they're so stressed out, their body is not making the hormones that actually build us and help us conceive and all of these other things that are need to be done or help our thyroid and maintain that metabolism. So remember that all the hormones play together in the sandbox. So when we think about breaking down, we, I'm also doing a lot of hormone testing to see where people are um, in their breakdown process. But cortisol is the big quarterback. So when you control cortisol or you try to have a mechanism, you can make a lot of changes in these hormones without even taking hormones. So again, the immune system, cortisol can be anti-inflammatory. And then as it gets more dysfunctional, as the stress is more chronic, you can start to get more and more uh, inability of the immune system as well as the hormone system. So where do I look at for vital areas to see for inflammation? Well, number one, two, and three is gut, right? Because we said that it's 80% of those immune cells are in the gut. So it can look like bad bugs, something called dysbiosis. It can look like heartburn, indigestion. It can look like SIBO. It can look like leaky gut or intestinal permeability. It can look like IBS. It can look like IBD. Any of those gut imbalances is possible from just being too stressed, just having too much stressors in your life without that balance. You can also, as I said, have hormone imbalance and you can have lots of nutrient imbalances because when your gut's not working, doesn't matter what diet you're on, you may not be absorbing any of those wonderful nutrients. So you have sugar dysregulation, you can, which can affect nerves, your cognition, your metabolism, your, so you could see how just one system of breakdown can affect 